G'day, I am driving through Outback Queensland in Australia and I'm pretty close to the Queensland New South Wales border. And behind me I have my dugout canoe which I've just finished a 50 day survival expedition up the Great Barrier Reef. And I am tracking back to where I live in New South Wales, but it just so happens that a friend of mine, Sophie Madison, who is trekking all the way across Australia with camels that she caught and trained herself, happens to be in about the area that I'm gonna be passing through. So I am meeting up with Sophie and I'm gonna join her on her camel trek for a few days, which is gonna be unbelievable. Oh, just to try and, <laughs> to try and, try and win, win them, them over. over. Yeah. You're looking, you can always win them over with carrots. Oh, this is little you. Clayton. Get on, mate. Here. Clayton's, Clayton's my like, he'll, he'll smell you. Yeah. But he doesn't like being touched. Nice. Charlie's my absolute biggest softie. Charlie's yeah. just like, Charlie would love to be like a petting zoo camel. Get on, mate. Like, he loves kids. He would. He carries 40 kilos. It's a big joke, really, that he's coming. <laughs> like, oh, really? Oh, yeah, like yeah, right. I, I could carry 40 kilos. <laughs> oh, no, no, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like, he's coming on a joy ride across the road, aren't yeah. you, Charlie? Oh. And he's always so tired at the end of the day, even, even with 40. Oh, look at you. Look at you. <laughs> he's just a big sookie boy. Oh, he looks like a sook. I thought maybe to begin with, if you're happy, if I can just sort of see what I've got to fit the stuff into. Yeah. And that'll decide, help me decide what to take and yeah, maybe what sure. not to. Yeah. Sure. So Sophie started her foray into camels many years ago. She worked on a camel dairy to start with and then went to Uluru and learnt the camel trade about how to load them up and train them, etc. at a place which basically was tailored for tourist trips and little camel treks out in the desert at short range from Uluru. And then she headed out and caught her own camels and trained them up. And she then got ready to start her expedition right on the western tip of Western Australia with a view of crossing the entire continent from coast to coast. She also split the trip in two and took a break over the summer period when it's just far too hot to walk through the desert in Australia. He's just got the fire going over there and I'm madly rushing through all of my stuff, figuring out the best way to pack it. Sun's going down and yeah, probably got another hour or two of this kind of stuff to go. Sophie had told me that she had all the food sorted but I didn't want to be completely useless so I brought a pumpkin to make a creamy pumpkin soup which was alright but I sort of overcooked the bottom and undercooked the sides. Alrighty, what you got there? A uh, bit of risotto tonight. So with some salami in it and some dried mushrooms and dehydrated peas. Um, yeah. Awesome. If anything has to go in two pots, then it's too hard. <laughs> exactly. In my books. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> One pot wonders, that's what I'm all that's about. That's right, half the washing up. I'm having a scotch and coke. And Sophie's having port. Mm. Yeah. The opportunity to hang out with you 
and learn stuff is just so unbelievably good. I don't know. I don't know how much you'll learn. I feel like I'm still learning oh, all the time. Yeah. They're the best teachers, though, really. I mean, you've pretty much done what 90% of Australia by camel by yourself from camels you've trained in the wild. <laughs> I guess I guess you basically you've it's trained, still, a, still a work in progress sometimes <laughs> I guess like with any sort of thing, new thing you sort of you transition from being a novice to actually being quite experienced but you never sort of go past a particular milestone where all of a sudden you feel like you yeah. know what you're talking about for you now you, you can literally think well you know I'm pretty experienced really There's, mm. there wouldn't be too many people with more experience at crossing Australia by camel I don't know. I mean, it's evolving all the time, I guess, the trip, you know. Today, it's, you know, I had way more cars coming, like, way more trucks coming bar past us and trying to work out, you know, the best way to steady them all up and I almost got smashed into the side of the fence by them. Did you say before that, you, like, you literally have trouble keeping weight on? But yeah, last year, I remember just, like, drizzling olive oil over, like, every dish I made just to try and, like, keep keep the weight on and I looked at a photo of me when I like walked out of the desert last year and holy shit my legs look skinny <laughs> <laughs> I mean probably not as gaunt as what you looked coming out of your adventure <laughs> um, but but yeah de definitely dropped a bit I've always planned to do my own large-scale camel expedition in Australia so recently I was living in Saudi Arabia for five years and just thought that's the best opportunity ever to learn about camels. So I actually bought a mother and a baby camel and got set up to do a pretty extreme solo expedition through a desert in Saudi Arabia. I kept this expedition very quiet because particularly at the time there was quite a high terror threat for Westerners in Saudi Arabia. So I certainly didn't really mention it anywhere particularly online. So that's why some people may not have heard about this expedition if you've been following me for a while. I'll talk more about this trip in future episodes. Alright, good morning. It's about 6 o'clock. And the sun's just about to come up. And it's time to get going. I'm just going to go and move my car to the homestead and they're going to look after it. There's the canoe and Frank's going to take me back to Sophie. Frank owns the property that Sophie's trekking through at the moment and he kindly allowed me to leave the car at his place. So past that bridge. Yes. The guys from uh, Pam and uh, uh, Don yes. said to go past the bridge and then yep. there's a little hook turn yep. and you go in past that chickpea crop. Kind of saddle from the back for any particular reason. So these are saddles that made while I was at Uluru. So each saddle fits each individual camel. So Charlie's saddle's a little bit different here. Charlie's actually got a riding saddle on him. So that's, that's your seat right here to ride on. But I actually don't, um, I don't ride, so yeah, I wanted to have one riding saddle just in case I was to injure myself or something. Clayton's got a wonky hump, <laughs> so when you put the saddle on, you've got to lean it to the left to compensate for his wonky hump. And they should sort of be at a point where they just fit snugly on their humps. But humps are the most awkward and annoying thing to have a saddle on. There's multiple reasons why I'm joining up with Sophie for a few days of her expedition. First and foremost, it's just an amazing opportunity to join up with someone who's doing their once in a lifetime dream trip. Secondly, I really wanna learn about camels and cameleering in Australia because it's so different to my experience in Saudi Arabia. And thirdly, it's also useful for Sophie to have footage of her expedition for later on so if i can just contribute my footage to her bank of images then uh, hopefully that'll help her out in the future so that's all five camels in a string now and all she has to do is control the lead camel and everyone else has to follow sophie's putting her saddle on all right so we're off sophie's obviously <laughs> running the show like sophie's been doing all the way across australia so uh, i'm just a tourist here and we're going to go through a gate here 
And then how many Ks are we going to do today, you reckon? Um, about 22, I reckon. Yeah? Yeah. Cool. So it's about 9 o'clock now, a bit of a late start. So you get in around 4, you reckon? Something like that, yeah. I reckon, yeah. Cool. Give the camels a bit of grazing time before it gets dark. Cool. At the moment, there's tons of feed for them, so... Um, I don't feel so bad cutting in on their grazing time. I think they're eating pretty well, generally. So I'm just playing catch up to Sophie. I was just flying the drone. Yeah, it's really nice just being with someone that's already fully ingrained in their expedition. You're so used to just doing it all solo and it's just so happy doing what she's doing. It's bloody, it's unreal. All right, we've just come into, is it a wheat paddock? Yeah, wheat field. And we're gonna parallel this for okay. a while. So you've probably done at least 4,000 k's-ish now, right? Yeah, so I reckon it'll be, yeah, three and a half probably. How many snakes have you seen or almost trodden on? <laughs> you know what, actually, two. Yeah. One at a station when I pulled up at the end of last year. Yeah. That was the first one I saw in a hay pile. And then one at the beginning of the year at Cooper Pedy setting out. Like, otherwise, it's one of the most common questions I get asked is, how many snakes have you seen? Yeah. Barely I, seen it. Barely seen any sing, a single snake. It's certainly been my experience too. Like, you know, you do long trips. Yeah, you, you maybe just see one snake. You might just see a tail or something. Mm, and that's yeah. it. Yeah. And there's maybe a couple of places I've seen, like maybe some places where you fish and there's, there is a bunch of tiger snakes on a certain piece of river. Yeah. Or maybe a bunch of pythons somewhere up in the Northern yeah. Territory in, in the wetlands. Yeah. But other than that, they're pretty rare. Yeah. Do you find yourself listening to music or podcasts when you're walking along? Um, sometimes, yeah. I try and sort of do the morning just walking with my own thoughts, I guess. Um, I find, yeah, just almost as a bit of a, you know, I don't want to feel like I've got sound all of the time. That's, you know, part of the beauty of being out here, I guess, is to, is to, is to be in the silence. So, so, yeah, I'll sometimes do half the morning or half the day going without. Sometimes I do a whole day going without. Some days you're kind of struggling and a bit bored on the trail and so I end up listening to music or podcasts all day. But yeah, it kind of varies. Do you find you like you've got an iPhone music library and you just listen to every bloody song and you <laughs> need to refresh it but you again, don't have coverage? I feel like the camels are kind of like, oh, this this album again. <laughs> like, although sometimes I like to, like if I'm really feeling like belting out stuff, I like to duet with the camels and yeah. pretend, like, where, uh, pretend like I'm singing it to them. Do you find you end up, I listen to, like while I'm on an adventure, I'll listen to podcasts about other adventures and other people doing Yeah, adventures. yeah. I re-listened to your Australian Geographic part, like two part podcast. Oh, did you? On, the, on this, this last I trip. I've listened to it the whole way through myself. So Sophie's been walking through the desert, which has been very unpopulated. She's just getting into the worst part of the trip, really, which is where there's roads and bridges and all of the land is owned and there's fences and you have to basically get on the main road here and there to be able to get over rivers or through people's properties. And camels, particularly her camels, she's training them from the wild, they're not very good with traffic unless they deal with it all the time. So there's a lot of stress involved uh, in them, you know, potentially bolting and getting hit by a car or running into a fence. Obstacles can be a real pain with camels. Like you would think you just they just follow behind you, but it doesn't always work out like that. So I've just pulled up here for lunch, a pretty quick lunch stop. Time up for a mulga tree. Uh, chuck down some to eat. That's the handy bag with all the goodies and the stuff that needs to be accessed easily. It's just like a bottomless pit though. You can never find what you need. Just last night's risotto. So you normally go leftovers, do you, from last night? Yeah, normally. If I don't have any leftovers, I'll go cans of tuna. Yeah. Thank you so much. Cool, cool. I think 
think they came through. Where is the one? Just south of. Um, that. Okay, I came almost past you guys yesterday. It's the one out of Hebel, isn't it? Not far out of Hebel. Right, it's mid afternoon. I've actually got sore legs. My legs are <laughs> accustomed to canoes. Yours are accustomed to 5,000 kilometre walks. But it's pretty warm. There's absolutely mm. no wind at all. Yeah. So it's quite pleasant, but a little bit hot. Stellar day, but yeah, it's starting to warm up into summer, summer weather. I feel like it's not that hot, but it's that sort of that, you know, coming from the winter, it feels hotter than what it is. Sophie inevitably gets compared to Robin Davidson, who in the 70s, trekked solo with camels from Alice Springs in the centre of Australia right to the west coast of Western Australia. I'd say there was some inspiration from reading Robin's book called Tracks, which I've read a couple of times. It's a great book. Certainly Sophie's motivation though is not to try and better what Robin has done. I do think that the two of them would probably get along very well because they're both such down-to-earth, humble people. Uh, I don't personally know Robin, but I get that impression from her book. So it's definitely, it was a different time back in the 70s for Robin. It's you know, pretty pioneering for a woman to be doing it then. It's still a pretty big deal for a man to be doing what uh, Sophie's doing now. I think some men have done it, but it's even more difficult for her to do it because just physically she's not as big and as strong, but she's amazingly capable the way she can lift stuff on and off the camels. And she has developed her own leadership style. She's told me that copying the male leadership style of camels doesn't really work for her. She's found her own way. And she is just as competent at leading the camels and controlling them in difficult situations and getting them to do what she wants without being a big physical man. Come, buddy. Up. Up. Mackie boy, let's go. Up. Three, two, one. Oi, let's go right now. Up, up. Good boy. She's also totally capable of lifting all these heavy trunks and loads, which to be honest, they are pretty heavy because I've been picking them up on this trip myself. Sophie's trip is actually twice the distance of Robin Davidson's trip. And Sophie did it with camels that she caught from the wild and trained herself. Like, it's a pretty big deal. And she's so close to finishing her trip. And it's going to be such a huge achievement for her to get to the other side of Australia and do it in the way that she's done it. Thanks for watching this episode. I hope you've enjoyed watching Sophie do her thing. In the next episode, we're going to look at a bit more about my Saudi solo expedition more camping and life on the trail and also dive a bit into what gave Sophie the confidence to undertake such a massive crossing of Australia with camels. Please subscribe if you're enjoying these videos because there's going to be many more.